Today we are analyzing Intercontinental Exchange, ticker ICE. Over the next few minutes, I'll discuss my thoughts about the valuation of this company and its business quality. The company has a market cap of $65 billion, enterprise value of $81 billion. So you see about $16 billion in net debt on this business. That's about 20 billion, that's about 20% of the overall enterprise value. It's a pretty decent chunk of debt, capital markets industry. The Intercontinental Exchange, together with its subsidiaries, engages in the provision of market infrastructure, data services, technology solutions for financial institutions, corporations, and government entities. Three segments, exchanges, fixed income, data services, and mortgage technology. So exchanges is a pretty good business. Um, Does it say which exchange they own? Company operates regulated marketplaces for listing and trading, clearing of derivative contracts and financial institutions. Uh, This tends to be a pretty good industry. Offers energy options, equity options, cash equities, um, fixed income data, and proprietary and com- comprehensive mortgage origination platform. So sounds like a really good industry based upon that description, but we need to look at the actual numbers. From return on vested capital, it looks like they had um, amazing returns in 2001, 16%. You see pretty stable. Um, do they have any years of losses here? Um, they're profitable each and every year. That's a really good sign. Um, the overall return on vested capital is pretty low, though. Um, we see 6% return on vested capital, 10% return on equity. These are pretty low results uh, for a business. Overall, these return on vested capital numbers, 20 straight years of profitability is a good sign. Um, that signals a high-quality business. These results signal a relatively lower-quality business. I'm going to guess there's a lot of intangibles because my understanding of the exchange business is that it's a very strong business to be in. So I don't really understand why these results are so poor unless they've been overpaying for acquisitions and then that gets embedded into the balance sheet. And so we'll see that when we get to the balance sheet. But trading at a pretty steep price, PE of 39 is a very high price to pay for any company. Um, It's very clear why that is though when you look at these CAGRs. So they're growing revenue at 21% a year assets 18% a year, for cash flow 16% a year, so EPS only 5% a year, but I'm thinking it's probably better than that because I mean, when you just look at these numbers, you went from 64 cents to 258 or to $7 in 2021, so clearly they're growing substantially faster than 5% a year. I mean, if you just go from 2013 to 2021, that's 10xing your income over the course of a decade. Um, those are very impressive EPS results. Um, very impressive revenue growth. You've gone from 1.7 billion to 9.6 billion. So it's that four or five X, um, almost a, basically a five X in revenue over the course of a decade is very, very impressive. Um, so the revenue growth, the free cash flow growth, the e- and even this, you know, earnings growth suggests a very good company. And it would ex- also explain why the PE ratio is just simply so high. Um, so it's understandable why we're paying a high price for this. What I don't really understand is why this return on vested capital is so low when you're seeing results like this. I mean, your margins here start at 71%, go down to 54%. It suggests that maybe they've acquired some lower quality businesses over time, although it's been pretty flat since 2014. Um, see a big jump in operating profit. Operating profit is up 4x. Uh, overall, pretty good results. But I'm I'm just a little concerned about why are these returns so low? That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. So we're going to figure that out on the next page, income statement, balance sheet, and cash flow statement. If you're enjoying this video, hit that like button. Don't forget to subscribe. So let's look at the income statement. Cost of goods sold. So again, pretty high margins here. SG&A has gone up a lot. So we tripled our SG&A, but you forexed your gross profit. So that's fine. Um, other operating expenses is up a lot. Um, tripling since 2014. Um, 6x since 2013. There's a big jump here. I'm guessing there was an acquisition in this period. <sighs> Pre-tax income. So what's going on? Other non-operating income. A lot of big fluctuations here. So we see 1.4 billion here in 2022. That's distorting some of these numbers. A lot of share dilution. Why are there so again? Big jump in the shares outstanding from 2013 to 2014. Again, suggesting they made an acquisition in this time frame. Something to be aware of. 
um, if we just look at from 2014 to 2022, which looks like a better comparison time frame, I think this is a better judge of what's going on in the business. You can see that their shares on standing are flat, basically. 563 million to 561 million. They've declined a little bit, but an imperceptible amount. Um, nothing we could rely on, but basically we could say their shares outstanding are flat since this acquisition in 2013. Um, that 2013 acquisition clearly led to a big jump in your net income, jump in your operating profit, jump in your gross profit, but also changed the business. They had much higher gross profit margins before then, and so now they have lower gross profit margins. Um, something to be aware of on that piece, but I really need to study the balance sheet because I think this is going to tell us a lot. So. Yeah, so we're seeing these other current assets. Like, what what is going on here? Um, this is a huge amount of assets for this business. And it doesn't make a lot of sense to me why you have so much there. They have other current liabilities. You would really need to study the 10K um, annual report to understand what's going on here. Uh, the problem is QuickFS is not really sorting out the detail around these numbers because if we pull this number out and we pull this countervailing number out i'm going to guess this is a lot of the derivatives basically you're taking on options derivatives um there's probably a lot of assets that they have on their balance sheet that aren't really their assets maybe they're owned by someone else and they're earning a fee on them something along those lines is really what's going on here because i don't think this makes sense um, maybe this is a, some sort of float or something, but there's nothing here that suggests to me that this is like a real asset that they're earning money from, but it would explain why their results are so poor on a return on capital basis. Cause it's saying, Hey, look, look at all the capital we have, but they have very little cash. They have no short term investments. They have very little accounts receivable. Um, their PP and E is almost nothing. I mean, 1.7 billion in PP and E and they were earning, you know, three times that in net income. So you're talking like 300% returns on your PP&E. They do have a lot of goodwill. You see that big jump in goodwill here. Um, you know, they added a huge amount of assets in 2012, 2013 when they made this acquisition. Goodwill skyrocketed by 7 billion. Intangible assets went up by 8 billion. So you see a huge amount of debt here, you know, a huge amount, you know, $15 billion in additional assets here. They did increase the returns here, but again, it's just a lot of assets. Their total intangibles here are a very significant chunk of the overall balance sheet, especially if you remove this number and you just look at it, they have almost no tangible assets. So the core return of the business on their tangible assets is incredible. You're talking about triple digit type returns, maybe quadruple digit type returns, 300%, 500%, 1000% type returns on their underlying capital. But the way the balance sheet works, the way our accounting works is you have to take into account the money you've actually paid on past acquisitions. So that is a key part for why these numbers are lower. Um, when we go back here, you can see that acquisition really dropped it before 2012, 2013, they were earning double digit returns in best capital, 12%, 13%, 12%, 12%, 14%, 22%. These are really, really good numbers. They made that acquisition. They paid a very large price for that. And since then they've been substantially lower. They also have this just huge, um, other asset here that doesn't fit into one of these nice categories. And it would be again, what you need to study on an annual report. Um, I'm not overly concerned about it, but it, it does explain why these numbers look worse than it otherwise would. Um, typically this would be a type of business that I'd want to own. Um, I just have some, I would need greater understanding about the underlying business here. When we look at this depreciation is low, right? $1 billion in depreciation when you have a balance sheet of $193 billion doesn't make any sense unless those assets aren't real assets. You do have stock-based compensation to something to be aware of. So they're having to do some buybacks to offset that. Um, they're paying a dividend. It looks like it's been growing quickly. Very little PP&E investment. Again, I mean, just look, it's like 15% of their overall cash from operations is going back into PP&E. It's a very low amount. You can see they're making constant acquisitions though. Uh, 2 billion, 2013, you know, 3.8 billion in 2015, 1.2 billion in 2018, 9 billion in 2020. All these acquisitions are really adding to the asset structure and that's really distorting the balance sheet. So 
to me, this would be something that would be do more work. I, I really like this industry. Exchanges are known for being an incredibly high quality business. You can see the stability of these numbers suggesting a very high quality business. It would be something worth further study. Um, based upon the numbers I've seen here, it's not something that goes on my watch list today. It would be something that I really want to do a deeper dive. Um, ICE is known for being relatively high quality. I've heard of it before. I've not spent a lot of time looking at it before, but I think it's one that you could learn a lot from. Anytime you have this stability of earnings, the reliability to make profit each and every year, and you combine that with growing at very high double digit rates, 20%, 15%, 18%, it suggests a business that can do very, very well for you in the future. Uh, 5Xing your revenue in a decade, four to 5Xing or more your EPS in a decade, all very good signs that shareholders could do incredibly well by holding onto this stock. The price is high, but again, you need to do some further work. If you learned something in this video, hit the like button. Don't forget to subscribe. And please consider checking out quickfs.net. My affiliate link is the first link in the description below. Using my link, you can get a free or paid account. It's a great way to support the channel so that I can get a commission if you use my link. Thank you for listening. And until next time, stop paying fees, start building wealth.